<laughs> can everybody hear it? We can hear yes, you, sir. Oh, that's oh. awesome. Hey, 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 hi, driving. Hi, hey, hi. where are you driving from? So that way you can get this party started. Yeah. Oh, look at Matt. He's here, Professor. Matt. Hey, my boy. There you he go. He doesn't like me, Matt. Professor, he doesn't like me. Matt, he doesn't like me. What am I going to do? You don't like it. It's impossible that he doesn't like you. Impossible. It's just impossible. You're just putting Matthew, words. Matthew. You're just putting words there. Tom. Oh, sir, how are you? Oh, how are you guys? Good to see you. Márcia aí, ó. Márcia chegando. Everybody's getting connected. Gabrielzinho, bom te ver, meu querido. Tá bonito na foto. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of people, guys. That's we awesome. Got, we, we got a quite few folks, professor. Um, That's awesome. Thank you very much for uh, being part of this. Uh, I'm very suspicious to say, to talk, to mention about you. The only thing I kind of remember when you were brown belt and you flipped me over a couple of times in Leblon when you visit my school, I was just like a blue belt or something. And uh, I remember Libori gave me like some kind of like flips upside down. And I said, man, that's great, you know? I don't remember none of that. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Well, Master, thank you very much for being part of this. You know, we are very grateful. It's an honor to have uh, somebody like you with such a caliber. Um, everybody that's watching us, please, guys, any questions, you know. Libor is an a encyclopedia with uh, jiu-jitsu moves, history. Oh, I mean, vivid emotions and, and scenarios, like through the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, going through the... MMA world, Japan, Pride, I mean, you guys name it. He's being all of that. Um, Please, don't put me on the spot. You already did, huh? Already <laughs> did. Master, one of the things that I, want, I, I got the think. cure for a coronavirus. Oh, you come come on, think of that. <laughs> you want to become a scientist. Become a scientist. Another oh. thing that I'm going to remember when Master was a world champion, uh, he used to have a, a kimono. Uh, I think the brand name is uh, Izo, if I quite remember. Izo is, yes, you're right. It has a flag. So a little bit of a history. What's happening was when Willibody won the world, right, against Henko Pardwell, greatest match, you know, like everybody on the gymnasium got nuts with the armbar. So Willibody gave that gi to Kiko. Did and I, yeah. I got so jealous. I got so <laughs> jealous. I want to take that gear from Kiko. But guys, you guys don't understand. Kiko is like half of my size. As a matter of fact, his nickname was Liborinho because he looks like he fights like yeah. his body type <laughs> shape. If you guys know Kiko, my friend, the black belt is in China right now. He's the only one that fit on that gi, and I couldn't fit on that gi because my arms are so long. That got me so depressed. You guys don't have no clue. But uh, I couldn't take the gi, and Kiko got the gi. That's why Kiko is so good in the arm bar because all the energy of the arm bar oh my God. piled into that gi, and I will never be – I was okay in triangle chokes, but not good in the arm bar. So we guys talking to the masters of arm bar collector right there. I don't know about that, guys. I'm mean, at the time that armbar was really, was really popular, but you don't have many choices there. It was armbar and chokes. That was it, you know. And you see the this big hole of uh, of this whole entire new school of footlocks, right, gal, yeah, going on. Footlocks got it. At my time, uh, it, it was not popular. It was actually anti-popular. I think mm -hmm. Boyu was enough, you know, was young enough to get there. And the guys from the suburbs of Rio, they used to go there and try to go for the footlocks. And people who used to get booed on on tournaments because you're going for footlocks. And it's really not, it's not something that, you know, we're, we're used to. We started having very much encounter with footlocks when people started training with a no-gi. When in 1991... There was, uh, there was this really beef uh, between Luta Livre and Jiu Jitsu. And Carson Gracie was the guy who was choosing between everybody else to be the head coach of Jiu Jitsu 
against the Luta Lever guys. And from there on, in 1991, we really, the whole entire, you know, Carlson Gracie team, it started training no gi. And, and, and we started using a lot of footlocks and heel hooks, things that we did not really actually train it at the time because we, were, we came up from all this background of jiu-jitsu and with a gi. And 1991 was really the big transformation on, it, it was a big impact on the whole entire jiu-jitsu community because a lot of guys dropped the gi to, to start fighting MMA, which is not MMA, as it's Valetudo, Valetudo at the time. I mean, making after, you know, there's Valetudo and No Holds Bar and then MMA. But before that, it's 1991 that for us was a big, 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 big deal because it was on, well, you probably saw that. Well, you were, well, how old were you in 1991? Did you go there to, at that event? I, uh, the the Valetudo against Jiu Jitsu. Yes, Luta Livre against Jiu Jitsu. Yes, I was watching from the TV Globo, the exactly. Channel Globo in Brazil. Uh, I was, you know, listening to rumors and stuff. Oh, it just it just came out. <laughs> Boy, is out. Yeah, he's he's driving from Tennessee, Professor. So he may cut in and out a little bit. Oh, it's okay, but it's um the the thing is this this big Valetudo. Remember this at, at the time Valetudo was not really it was uh, it was anti popular. Let's put it this way: people used to see the Valetudos as a human cockfighting. It used to be a big big problem with that, which is for me even worse because I was a sponsor by the Bank of Brazil, which was the big bank there. Uh, I had this big sponsorship because I worked for the bank. So the bank actually put me aside to train and it just really actually don't need to do the, you know, that desk work. And for me, that was, that was a dream come true, but I could not get involved in MMA. I could not get involved in Valetudo because really was at the time of the human cockfighting. It's every, the reputation, it was really, really rough. And especially because he, you, you heard that he, he saw it on TV. And this thing on TV, guys, was a major. Imagine NBC on prime time, 7 o'clock at night, showing up Valetudo. And the guy's head button and blood everywhere. That was horrifying. For the next day, all the young kids wanted to do jiu-jitsu. Forget about Luta Libre. Everybody wants to do jiu-jitsu, but all the mothers and parents, so everybody was horrified with the, with the amount of blood that was in it. You know? It was really crazy, crazy times. But really was the transformation, was the beginning of everything, the modern MMA. Because from the 1991's Valetudo, everybody wants to start competing in Valetudo. And at the same time, 1993, you see, UFC was created. And then, then all the Carlson Gracie guys, everybody dropped the gi and started training for Valetudo. So all those guys are famous from the beginning, the Carlson Gracie team, Victor Bell for uh, Murillo, Maris Perry, Amory Bitech, uh, Alan Goyce, all those guys really fighting in, in, in Valetudo. Uh, that, was the, that was the big transformation. This is what Carlson did. Carlson was able to get the best guys in the world with the gi, and suddenly there are the best team in, in Valetudo in the world. You know, it was pretty fast. And that was a huge transformation in training and everything else. That was open eyes for everybody too. That was the first time that people started really actually, not just training with the gi, but people started really having an encounter with, with the conditioning which was nothing before. Nobody was doing conditioning. Well, Carlson, Carlson used to hate conditioning. Carlson used to say, man, you're going you're gonna to gas out. Are you doing weights? You're going to gas out. Well, watch out. He used to play many of the jokes about working out. He used to say many things about that. So nobody really actually working, uh, doing conditioning. And when we really, we had this encounter going to the Valley Tudors and we have this, wrestlers from everywhere, judo guys in the Olympic game, all these Olympians, everybody was doing some sort of condition. So then we're incorporated in the team. 
and people started working out, which makes a huge difference for everyone. Less, less injuries, more conditioning, more cardio, more everything. That was a big transformation from that. And Master, go ahead. You okay? What, what, how was like uh, your first beginning on jujitsu? What, what make you say, I'm gonna do jujitsu? Because what make me do jujitsu is literally like after that, uh, that match, and then talking Rodrigo coming to the beach and recruiting like six guys of us, like, hey. You guys want to train jiu-jitsu and Rodrigo little tap on my shoulder you're going to train jiu-jitsu with us so that was my my will to go so if somebody tap on your shoulder if somebody give you a phone call uh how he got to live you drive himself walk himself to the to the temple of brazilian jiu-jitsu with your carson gracie team how was that beginning well for me it was different i i was 16 years old and I went to a barbecue on my first girlfriend. And, and my first girlfriend's uncle was Carlos Rosado, which is the only red belt from Carlson. And he was a black belt at the time. And he, he saw him as Stucky and said, hey, man, you, you know, Stucky, you should have started doing some jiu-jitsu. You've got to start training jiu-jitsu. And he invited me to go. This was a Sunday. On Monday, I was there. You know? That's awesome. Um, professor, I have oh, a question. Jack, for you. Oh, so, I'm gonna so, have to hold it for a sec. Somebody knock on my door here right now. Hold on. Okay, hold it for a second. They're crazy. Whoever's knocking your door, crazy. Out of his mind. <laughs> I wish you'd have left the screen going so you could see if it's uh, bad. Somebody not. Oh, somebody's gonna knock you out of the door. Oh, do you know who you're talking about? Like you have an idea. Dog. That time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Moving me up every time. Uh, after, after coronavirus, somebody else's work. You can talk right from door to door. Oh, please. Oh. No, sorry, guys. <laughs> no problem. Somebody knock at the door to try to sell something. Is that is that insane? Wow. Right now, for real? <laughs> this time. The coronavirus thing is kind of weird, huh? No, no. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. I'm, honestly, it's, it's insane. All right. Sorry about that. Well, desperate times, Professor. Maybe. maybe yeah, I know. I imagine that. But you can't come to somebody else's doors, knock at the door with no mask and anything else, you know. And it's, come on. So, so to change the subject, kind of go back a little bit to what you were talking about, um, because I know you have a little bit of a paradox in this. You came from this super tough, like probably the toughest generation and team of jujitsu practitioners, right? Um, and then you go on and, and, you know, I don't know if everybody knows, but start ATT and do all these other things. Um, and then you decided at some point you left ATT because of what it seems like the direction of where MMA was going. Um, and, and there's kind of this, this paradox in there somewhere. Can you maybe further explain that? Yeah, so my inspiration came from Carlson. You can understand that. Imagine that. You're, 1991, I was a part of a group of guys that are training for the Valitudo against the Luta Libre. But I could not fight Valitudo because of my sponsorship, because of my job. You know, I have a really, well, you knows this, you know, Brazil, Bank of Brazil is, is, is a government bank. You have to, you have to test to get in. I got this in, in a contest with more than 30,000 people to get a spot inside. And I was a manager inside there too. So I have this really good job that I've, for some work that I've done, and I got a sponsorship from it, which was a dream come true, right? And but I saw Carlson teaching in 1991 while Carlson was teaching and I was able to train with some guys and this is, was the first time and the jiu-jitsu really got united, right? Guys like Fabio Grugel, Marcelo Berg and, and some other guys there, they really got together to, to defend the flagship of, of, of jiu-jitsu against the Luta Livre. And Carlson was the main guy. Carlson was really actually 
teaching Valetudo for every, you know, every one of us in a room. It was a masterpiece. It's not just because he knew it, technique, but he got a leadership that he knew how to, Carso was a, Carso was a guy, man, that he could read people so well. And, and he knew exactly how to pressure point every single one, you know, to, to create a, a, a very competitive environment, but it's a safe environment at the same time. So what I'm trying to say that, you know, he's going to talk to me in a one way and he's going to talk to Valid Ismail in a different way. You know, he's going to, Valid needs to be angry. I don't. And he knew that. It's, it's, he knew how to, you know, orchestrate this pretty well. But I was able to see it and I was able to learn it a lot from him directly, teaching the guys the Valitudo. Teaching. And some of them inspired me a lot. I knew it for a fact. I, I, I went to school for business. I, I went, you know, I have a corporate job. But at one point there, I knew that I would never be great at banking. I, it was not my thing. I had to make a decision and, and pursue a life, a career, and things that I love it or, or you know, keep it a job. And that was, for me, it was different. I mean, at one point right, right there, I have to make the decision, and I knew it that would never be great and working in a bank, but I could be great doing what I do. So I decided to leave, you know, and when I left, uh, right after that, there was Brazilian top team, and we built Brazilian top team that what it was, and the best team in the world in one point. And, and reality is, I wanted to learn English, <laughs> believe it or not. You know, I still don't know how, but, but it, I, I, the whole reason why is there is one person speaking English in the whole entire Brazilian top team was Maurice Perry, and he was the manager. So I thought at the time we were to fight at this event in Japan called Pride Show, and this is really was a big event in Japan. This event over there was, um, that was with everybody. I don't know if you guys remember Pride, but that was the time the Arona and Paulo Filio and Minotauro Nogueira and Rogerio, that's all those big names, Victor Belfort, all those guys were competing there and it was a big, big market. And, and at the same time, we have this whole entire new generation of guys coming in and nobody to manage them. And I thought, of, well, that's my time to do it. So I'm, I'm going to learn English. And I, and I got a proposal to work in Japan. There is this big investor in boxing there. This guy has two world champions in boxing. Very famous guy. He wants to get into MMA in Valley Tudo. And he wants to open a gym. He wants to open a Brazilian top team there. And then at the time, I had the idea, come on, it doesn't make sense for us to build up every team with the Brazilian top team only. If we go to a country like Japan, we have to open the Japanese top team. If we go to America, we have to open the American top team. And Canada and Australia, from that so far goes on. And But right after that, I, I came to corner Murilo Bustamante against, uh, Mario, um, against Chuck Liddell. That's when I met Lambert. And I told him, hey, I'm going to Japan to learn English. And he said, no, come over here. And, and I came over, and after that, I had an idea. Well, I sold my part of Brazilian top team to Mario, Murillo, and, and Bebel, and I got the name of American top team, and we built up from there. There you go. Who is that? The Hezenga. Shane. <laughs> Look at that. <clears throat> there you go. So, so I knew it in a certain way that, you know, coming to America, America is the capital of the world. If it works here, you know, it works in everywhere and anywhere. But we did not know that it was going to get so big as it was. You know, it was, was we, we came to the right time with a lot of knowledge, and I knew that American Top Team would be a baby well anyway because I had so much knowledge from Cross and Grace and Brazilian Top Team. At the same time, and the leadership of that, and 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 it's people, right? The most important thing, the biggest commodity, is not even knowledge. It's it's people. How to deal with people? How to train with people? How to how to how to be? You know, in the in the hardest time, like it is right now, how you overcome all this? This is really the the key of dealing with it is to is to care. It's to care. It worked more for you 
have a coach that cares about you, that's somebody who really actually is a, you know, who's a technician, who just knows a technique. You really, it really is the key. The ingredient is love. And, and we grew. So when I got out of American Top Team and we came over here to Orlando, we knew it also. There was one thing about American Top Team was growing as a business there, but there was one thing. Um, the licenses are being put it out there, but without any structure. The only thing that we're getting is the name. You know, we got the logo, but the logo does not mean success. Logo is far away from success. And if you don't really know the business side, if you really don't know, if you don't have a comprehensive marketing plan, if you don't have a, a sales plan, and structures material, if you don't have a, 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 a class structure and you teach the next, next generation of instructors there, you don't have a business, you have an enterprise. You can have a very successful enterprise if you just can do it once. You know, If you can replicate, you can have a business. So the whole goal is this. And I started researching a lot and doing a lot of content and creating materials and, and going to learn everywhere. And at one point there, when I got out of American Top Team, there was definitely the way we're doing it is, guys, I am, I am a martial artist first. I always was a martial artist first, always. They're always different for me. And I came from a point there, although I understand the business of, of mixing martial arts as it is today, but I came from a part that was, you fight for jiu-jitsu. You, you know, you fight for the jiu-jitsu and you fight for, for your country. That's what it was in the most part. You represent two things that are most important. You may represent jiu-jitsu or your style and you represent the country. That's basically what we were fighting for. But besides fighting for that, I, you know, there is a model of success that's, um, um, everybody sees this. You know, the WWE and the boxing shows up a model of success to put to put tails in seats and sell tickets and sell pay-per-views and, and go above and beyond, you know, what a, a lot of what people say. And but that's not for me. I just can't do it. It's just too much. You know, it's just too much when you start talking to some, somebody's mother or father or religion, you know, and put everybody in the same bag. You know, because you're from this country or that country or, or your color of your skin or whatever it is. that This is really, literally not me. I never was that guy. And and it took a turn that as much as you think that guys are playing the role, but it's not. You have to have that little, you know, the little seed inside of you to, to, to represent this way. So it was, it was not, it, it was getting too dirty for for my personality um and that's the problem too i always was this with this this you know try to be nice guy living i live by my you know by, by the golden rule but everybody should be living the same you know you want to be treated well you got to treat people well and that's what it is and you don't you don't waste your words and you don't waste your it's it's entertaining i understand that i understand when people goes there especially there's guys there they're so smart and so funny and they can they can pull out sort of certain characters you know and i see this i i don't condemn everybody doing it but there's people that it's not like that there's people that they had that meaning uh and hate you have no idea how training high level fighters is because some of those guys, the only thing that they know in life is hate because they, you know, they, they survive on um, fighting and they have that thing inside and they transport this to the fight. Some, some that's like successful, some are not, but there is, there is a lot of, there's a lot of people that are, are you know, hurt mentally, you know, mentally and spiritually. And, and I have seen it be done for such a long time, you know, dealing with fighters, it's something that's not for everybody. And and my ability to, to you know, to kick tail, you know, to submit those guys, you know, just go train and, and, and put it out on a match there. It was something that really actually, you know, it, it shows up there to, to, to gain respect. And I have done this for a long, long time. But you get older also, they have to believe in what you say. Your, your words have to believe in what you say. 
But there is one thing. There are so many people saying, I mean, you got to make the money now. You got to say whatever it takes for you to be here in situations so you can score, you know, you're a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand million dollars or whatever it is there, which is not too much different than than what a lot of other people do. You know, some of those, some of the fighters that I see it, they can never open their mouths to say anything about a stripper or anything about a a drug dealer because you're doing the same thing. You know, they were really just doing anything. They were selling their souls for the money. And that's where reality. And I've seen this for such a long time, boy, and girls. So don't Master. go that way. Professor Master, well, how do you see the difference between the jiu-jitsu now? Like, as Professor Tom was mentioned, and you briefly mentioned about footlocks, and back in the days, they were booing. I remember that, the people from the, you know, the, 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 the other side of the town. Uh, how do you see now, uh, what's, what's, what's your thoughts about the jujitsu that you see right now with the new generation? What's your, what's your thoughts about it? I, I don't, guys, I, you know, there is new generation of jujitsu or new jujitsu, old, old jujitsu, but reality is, is all jujitsu. It's just, it's just a matter of creation. What's going to happen now with the new generation in 10, 15 years, there will be a new, new generation. How is that going to work? It's just always an evolution of the sport. You just got to tag along for anyone. There's a couple of things that I think is boring. Being a 50-50 guard for 10 minutes, it's boring. It's not going to make the sport grow. So you got to regulate that. But you have to learn everything. That's, you know, the beating bolos. You have to learn everything. I think it's valid to learn it. Um, I have I have a couple um, opinions about not learning takedowns. I think everybody has to learn a takedown for self defense. You have to learn it for for pure self defense. You have to be able to take people down or defend takedown. That's it for self defense. Um, you cannot just pull a you know beating bolo in the middle of the street. You know in a real street fight. So you you better know a couple of things. I'm not saying that it's not possible to happen and you do it, but that's important for you to, to, to understand. But new generation, old generation, I don't separate that much. But about the footlocks, I think the footlocks, it's, it's a whole created by the IBJJF rules that do not allow footlocks. And when you don't allow footlocks, the guys are training. They're not training for footlocks. That means that if you go to ADCCs, 100% people are going to try to compensate on this. And that's what happened. And my guess is you've got to learn how to do footlocks and you've got to learn how to defend them. And period, that's what it is. As an incorporation, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm open to learn, guys. Of course, you've got to safeguard uh, the health of everybody. You're not just going there and, and let with no rules and now kids are doing heel hooks or no, it's not like that, but learn the heel hook, learn how to defend, you know, and, and play the rules. ADCCs are, you can, you can power bomb somebody in ADCC, you know, all these things here are important for you to know if you're, if you're willing to play all the rules, you know, that's important. So keep your mind open and, and learn it. That's what I think. Hope you answer Speaking, speaking of takedowns, I know you started when you were a little kid in judo. Um, do you have a favorite takedown? Somebody is asking that. Matthew is asking, what, do you have a favorite takedown? Do you teach one? Do you yourself like a particular favorite? Um, I do. My personal favorite is Sionage. But, Ipon Sionage. But it's not all the time you do it. You've got to learn everything. You know? And I come from the time that when I learned judo, Judo has the, the incorporation of all the takedowns from wrestling, the single and double leg. So it really is, it really is a situation that, you know, you've got to learn everything. You've got to learn everything. And there's a lot of takedowns in jiu-jitsu that it, you don't find it anywhere else either. So you've got to research, guys. The reality is you've got to keep in an open book. You've got to be able to learn. You've got to be able to, you know, Got to be able, got to be able to be open to learn. And you do your own research. That's important. That's 
key is a sex for anything in life, right? Even if you don't don't use it, right? Professor, um, yeah. talking about this as well, like uh, we see most likely on the ADCC. How was your mental preparation for the ADCC, the one that you actually uh, won, and how was because you can correct me if, if I'm wrong. It's been a big uh, gap when you were competing and then you got invited to actually show your skills uh, in Brazil. How was that for you? Like, how did you first of all receive the, the invitation? How was your first thought and your preparation? Because we have a couple of students here, they do compete. We have a couple of students that already put questions about uh, mental anxiety, how to deal with it. Some of the students, they do really well, but what's your thoughts uh, as a master, as a black belt, a person that competes several times, and then you have a, you stop, you dedicate your whole quarter to coaching, and then, okay, now I'm gonna compete in this great event. How was it for you? So, there is a story behind the, the competition there. Okay. Yeah. So, um, do you know Pedro Lotch or not? Yes. He actually popped my knee. Pedro Lodge. <laughs> I was I was drilling with him to the world's masters. I took his back and he kind of like just freaking popped my knee oh, two days man. before the tournament. So what happened is this. Pedro Lodge invited me, called me one day, and he invited me to spend some time with Sheikh Tahnoum. Sheikh Tahnoum was the guy who created the ADCC. So Sheikh Tahnoum used to invite a lot of people to spend time with him there. So I went there, I spent 15 days, training with Sheikh Tahnoum. And this guy is really, he's, a, he's for real, he's a black belt. He's now the Minister of Defense of, of the Emirates. So he's kind of away from jiu-jitsu, but he's legit. The guy's legit black belt. And I was training there. That was a time that, you know, I was just coaching. It's, it's just too much, it's too many guys. I have this crazy lifestyle, guys, that for me was, it was, Working on UFC fighters, and we understand this, in the amount of fighters that we have it, every weekend we were somewhere. Every weekend. Honestly, it was 30, 30 weeks out of the year we're out. It was really, really weird. And um, we were weird. It's, it's the life. It's the circus. You know, you go from, you go, you're leaving on Wednesday, Thursday, you're cutting weight, Friday, you're way in, Saturday, you fight, and Sunday, you're back home. And next year, again, next week, again, again, again. This is, was, it was a brutal. So for me, it was just dedication about the guys. It was just about the guys. It was just really give up, given, given, given. And when I spent this time there, I was training with Sheikh Tarnoum. The day before I leave, he says, Al Laborio, um, and at the time, don't forget this, Mario Sperry and Mario Sperry was the champion of the category. They called the Masters Division there. And he he had beat, beaten Hensel and Fabio Gurgel. So they wanted to find somebody else. And in and, and the last day, he says, Laborio, you beat San Mario. You can beat San Mario. That, that was just his comment there. So when I went back to to, or when I went back to Florida, his right main guy, his name is Guy Neves, is a British guy who actually is the president of ADCC. He called me, say, hey, Laborio, I have a proposal for you. Um, do you want to fight the ADCC? He said, yeah, of course I want to fight the ADCC. Well, but I just have an opponent for you here right now, and he already accepted. And it was Mario. <laughs> And I said, oh, man, all right. Oh, that was, a, that was a bad thing. But there is one thing. You guys, everybody has to understand. Number one is that was a really a tough time that we're building up the, the team. And there was somebody like um, Robbie Lawler, 
that was going to fight Tyrone Woodley too. That was in the making of making this happen. Robbie Lawler is a champion. Tyrone Woodley was right there. And we have a couple guys there, you know, at the top five. So it's just impossible when you you have somebody going to the top five of UFC, not not let them fight. It just doesn't make sense. Really, is it? It's it's insane. And in between MMA, it's pretty common that things like this happen, and people will fight. It's a different perspective, different approach. I came from a background that you don't even fight your teammate in the, in the finals of BJJ. You know, you really don't do this. You do go there and you, and you know, paper, scissor, paper, rock and scissors, and that's it. And figure it out who's going to win. Um, if it's right, if it's wrong, I change it. When I came to America, I really did. And I made everybody at the ATT gyms to compete, right or not. You know, it is what it is. It's more, it's cultural. So when that happened, you don't forget this. So I have this situation of having those guys competing against each other. They have to fight against each other. And I'm guiding by example. Beyond anything else, Mario was the head coach of Black Zillions. Yes. And I was the head coach of American Top Team. So that's it. Let's do it. You know, we had no problem with that. And I have all the respect in the world for this guy. I still have it. You know, I think he's a brilliant fighter and he's a good person. And and, and that's it. You know, he's you not know, he's not my best friend. I don't think I would do that with Murillo Bustamante, who is really one of my best friends in the world. But Mario it wasn't. Mario is a it, it was a friendly guy. You know, it's a different thing. You guys both actually been to at the dojo and with Rodrigo. You guys gave me the black belt, and I felt very honored. You know, that was awesome, and everybody was like, "Whoa." They both are here and say, yeah, man, whatever happens on the mats, it's on the mats. But after that, everybody's friendly. And I have a picture of you guys. I I got to send it to you, share information. And like on the old days, you know, like just like showing a move and things like that, you know. Uh, also for talking me, about, you know. For, you, for, me, for me is one thing. When I did that, uh, I did that for me. Uh, I did this. I did this because I really wanted to do this. And it, it was a period of time that I trained completely for myself. I really took the time and spent the time to heal. I heal, you know, physically, mentally, and spiritually. That's something that the sport take it. And some of you guys here, I don't know exactly the level of everybody, but that's one thing that happens. There is a spiritual component on, on jiu-jitsu, I think that a lot of people don't know yet or didn't see yet. And when I say spiritual, don't, don't mix up with religion. There's nothing to do. Re re spiritual for me is a connectivity with something that you believe that's powerful. Like if you believe in nature and nature is powerful to you, you know, nature is powerful. We all sit down in the house right now because of coronavirus. That's nature. And we got to do it. So there is a superior power there. You've got to believe that there's nothing you can do about it, and you just got to relax with it. You know, you just got to trust that the, the superior power has a better understanding of life. And if it's not, it is what it is. You just got to move on. And from that, you, if you believe in destiny, if you, if you believe in, in science, if you believe in luck, if you believe in whatever it is there, that's your spirituality, you know. And, and I think jujitsu brings a lot of this. And a lot of white belts can see it. And for Boyu right now, which is in a situation, and Tom and some, some of you guys here, Zazino, has, guys are having school. They still have to pay the bills. I think the mission right now is, first of all, unite everybody, but make people understand that jiu-jitsu is much more than that, just a physical sport. It's much more than that. There, there, is a, there is a cue on the physical, of course, but the physical heals the mental. Jiu-Jitsu right now is a huge tool for, for, for against depression, against anxiety, against uh, against PTSD, against where uh, Matt is here. I don't know if Matt is here right now. Matt is here. Matt is part of a of something that we're creating in the University of Central Florida. That's actually Matt. For, by the way, is a psychologist. He's, he graduated in UCF. And my student at UCF. He was the first level of students 
the water we were doing, the site of the University of Central Florida. We have a group of guys there, all psycho psychology majors, and a person that is a study to actually conduct a research about jujitsu and mental wellness. Because we all know is mental wellness. This is really definitely good for your mind. It's not just good for you. There's tons of researchers out there telling you that physical condition or uh, any sports is good for your mental state. But jiu-jitsu really is. If you do it the right way with people leading like Buyu, you know, if you've got a good leadership and in a good environment, this is a tremendously good for your mental wellness. You know, we all we all know this, especially at this point here right now. But there's a lot of white belts that don't know because they never tried that. For them, it's still just a just a way to you know to get a good workout. And there's people that has to be taught of that. We got to talk to them about that, and make them understand there's so much more than this. There's so much more than just to learn an arm bar. The, just, it's, just a, it's just, even if you don't really actually know anything, if you don't have any physical skills or any you know, or technical ability, you still can train jiu-jitsu if you know how to tap and if you know the rules of the game. And that is a condition. And you're part of the, you're part of the culture, which is another thing. This is a culture will involve in jiu-jitsu, you know? And I think it's essential, at least it's essential for me. I know it's essential for... For Buyu or Tom and Shane, you know, there's some of the guys there that I know that, you know, they live their lives with the, with the martial arts in and, and perspective and help them so much. There's so many other values that we find into it. But, but all this, guys, uh, you have to taste it first, you know. you got to get a little bit in depth to understand how much this is, can help you. And I, I truly believe. <laughs> um, Professor, that's awesome. Can you, do you, I don't want to uh, skip around, but if you can mention what your, you have a foundation, a, a business called Martial Art Nation. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah. What happened was this. I started working, when I moved to Orlando, I started working on the licenses when this thing with American Top Team went down. I, I really actually, um, we created a new brand called Martial Arts Nation. So Martial Arts Nation was this, you know, this Akum this amount of of research and content that we have it that we put we decide like this thank you we decide to take everything and put and in real books so this is a marketing book here right now this is this is a, a value book that we talk about so determination this is a part of the instructor material the, the instructor has to learn like this this is part of, you, you've got to teach how to teach the instructor. That's what it is, you know, for, for, for a school owner. So everybody has the same vision everywhere. Everybody has to, the, the Big Mac has to be the same everywhere. That's the part of business. So when I started doing this, so much content from so many resources and sources, and I started compiling this and manuals and standard operational procedures, and, and I started looking for people to help. When I, when I started doing this, I ended up bumping into the UCF. You know, I said, man, I need help. And, and I live 10 minutes from UCF, which is the second largest university in, in the United States. And when I got there, Matt knows this, you know, we got, got there, there was, there was no jujitsu. There was nothing. There was an MMA club. And I end up, and that's a, another story because when I was, I researched online, Google, martial arts and UCF, and lead me to a professor named Dr. David Fukuda, who has a research about acid lactic and, and grips in judo. And I went to my Facebook and found him in a Facebook that we have a one friend in common. So I went to that friend and the friend introduced me to Dr. Fukuda and then everything started. You know, all this because I need some people to help me, you know, help me to make the work happen. And talking to him, from there on, we have, we have classes. We have a credit course of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu inside University of Central Florida, which is, 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 the, first, is the first credit course inside, the universe, inside of Florida. And, and we started the club. When we started the club, we have 16 students. 
And now we have a 360. And this thing's just booming, guy. This thing's just really. But the approach that we took it, which it was really different, is guys, I'm, I'm not interested in the medals and the trophies. I really, I really don't. I have done that. I think it's cool. I think there is a space for that. But I think. I think that IBJJF, for example, is just really destined to to create events for those guys, and and given the proper spotlights for for you know for high level fighters, which is which is leave a lot of other guys like you, Tom and Shane and Buyu that that never won the black belts world championships, you know, on that level. That, that leave you in a, in a limbo. And I think there was a recognition for that too. I think you guys, if you dedicate your life and helping people and doing this, um, that, that's, you, you're supposed to have some support too. You know, that's what I have in mind. But it wasn't for the intention that. I think that when I got deep in, into the university and I saw the world of knowledge that was presented to me, and that was something that was, was amazing. It was amazing, so many levels, guys, because now we have a collaboration with the kinesiology department. We have a collaboration with the psychology department. We have a collaboration with the sociology, with the UCF Global. There's so many branch at hours that we did that with the sport, you know, with the recreational center. So we start with 16 students, and now it's 360. We have 70, 80. Matt knows this. There were 70, 80 people, but not the most important. For me, it was... Man, I'm dealing with kids with 18 years old. That's the first time in life that they get out of the house and they get into the jujitsu. Like, you, you know, you know, putting that mask, that face, like, you know, playing the tough kids. And now I'm an adult. And two weeks later, they're kids again. You know, so what we created was a place that they can be themselves. But now we have psychology telling you, hey, we can't create, and Matt is part of this. Let me tell you this for you, because you should be, you should attack with this kid, because our goal is this. The next goal, guys, the next idea. Master, Master, hold up, hold up, hold up. We have ceviche in the house for the first time. Oh my God, this no, is no, like everybody, everybody, give round everybody give a round of applause. Everybody give a round of applause. First time, Master, we've been doing this for like two months. And Ceviche decided to show up. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my, it's gonna it's gonna snow in Miami. Stop the machine! Stop the. I'm gonna take the picture. Man, man. I'm gonna take the picture. Man, oh. this hair is a success. <laughs> we, hey, that's it. I'm I'm leaving. I'm dropping the mic. Poof. <laughs> but what say is this? You know, <laughs> I love that guy. Uh, we had such great stories, me and Ray. Oh man, I can't call. I don't call. We can't hear you, <laughs> Ray. Ray, we can't hear you. Look a quick. We got you. We can hear you now. Do you hear, you hear me? Hear you. Yep. Now he can. Now we okay, can. Everybody, give a round of applause. Now he can hear. <laughs> 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 How you guys oh, doing? Man. Good, you're, you're, you're a little late. <laughs> I'm, I'm in my head, man. That's I'm normal. Not, normal. Early. Normal. You're early. For Cuban time, you're early. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you guys up to, man? Ricardo, I want to tell you, Professor, I've been living here in Colorado for three years, and Ceviche has not come to see me yet. I'm just oh, saying. Oh, man. You see cool. that? That's <laughs> yeah, a guilt trip right there. No, right there. Never ending. <laughs> well, never ending. Well, I'm living here for five. He didn't come to see me either. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, I went oh, to see him. Going on the bus. <laughs> Jesus, is that what I joined the Zoom video to hear everybody throw me under the bus? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there is one thing about it. Look, guys, if you ask this guy, if you ask the right Ray, how much of mental – wellness there is in jiu-jitsu for you seriously if you really have a percentage from the 100 percent how much mental is meant how much is this is therapy for you it's a pure therapy we actually we actually call it once you get into a real jiu-jitsu 
a, a camp, a, a real mat. It's everything from religion, philosophy, psychology. It's all in the one place. But uh, mental therapy wise, man, it uh, uh, no, nothing really matters after you uh, finish having five five minute rolls with some of the savages uh, on the mat, and you if you're too uh, egotistical, your ego goes down. If you're Nah, if you don't have enough yeah. ego, your ego goes up. It kind of balances everything up. That's it. So I guarantee if I ask questions right now, right now, guys, tell me how many of you guys here are using this for therapy? And how many of you guys here are using this for, for competition? I want to be the world champion, and this is what my life is. There you go. But that's, that's the, really the percentage. By IBJJF standards, only 3% of people, 3%, of the 100% of jiu-jitsu are for competition. 97% is doing this recreational. 97. I'm not talking about a guy who, repeat, who competed once in life. I'm talking about a, a, a real competitor. They're going to go to the circuit and really compete there. But but really, 97% of people are doing this for, for the three reasons. I want to look good, I want to feel good, or both. That's it, you know? That's it. Jiu-jitsu is the new therapy. Jiu-jitsu is the new, the new yoga. Yoga for tough people. That's it. That's what I think. No. I wanted to uh, quickly just mention before uh, we run away, but uh, just mention what a great example you are, sir. I mean, we have great examples here in this room right now in terms of the leadership you were talking about. You know, really tough guys that are you know, not sensitive, but, you know, have, have a well sense uh, of, of understanding of other people's awareness and feelings and, and trying mm -hmm. to be, do the right thing and, you know, be kind to people. Uh, Professor Amir is, is that guy. He's known as that guy. Of course, Buyu, yourself. So uh, we had, you know, uh, uh, Medeiros on here last time. Um, all you guys are such amazing leaders and great examples. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that to you. Thank you so oh, much for man, being Tom, that, thank that, you. that guy. But, but understand this, guys. You're, you're, if your students, you know, some of you guys here know pretty well, but if you're a student of Buyu, and we're here all because this is our glue, right? Buyu is our glue. Man, I know this guy for such a long time. You know, he really, from my school, my personal school, we was the first jujitsu instructor that I put over there. If you guys don't know that, you know, that's for real. But you, I brought with you personally. He'd say, man, you want to work with me? Come over here. He had absolutely the best attitude, the, the best effort. It was everything. It was the best conduct, the best discipline, the best of everything, you know, from, from all the passion. The guy could come from, from, you know, from the neighborhood that he was in Leblon and drive all the way to Baja, which is, I don't know, one hour or whatever it is there to, to get to commute. You know, it was, it was because of him. It was a special. Like I said, it's, it's really about caring. You think about, ah, oh, because this guy is such a great coach. No, it's, it's because the guy cares so much that we figured it out a way to teach him or you figure out a way to make you better. That's the point. The whole point is this, you know? I learned from you too, Master. Remember that. I got smashed by you many times, so I have to learn from you. <laughs> yeah. This, this smashing or not, guys, this thing about smashing, it's like, it's like Ray. We talk about that. And, I, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity, but I always tell you that on the sidelines. You know that. That's, that's no secret to nobody else. <laughs> You gotta find a way to just to be in a match, guys. Even if your body doesn't take the same anymore, you know, that's the reality. You know, if you really, the best thing we can teach our kids too is learn how to lose and just make sure that they keep coming. That's what's gonna take us out of this Corona crisis or craziness, whatever it is. Let's keep coming. Let's keep driving. Just keep moving. You feel like it's bad, just keep on moving. Put your bladders on and just, just, just keep it. That's what I take from I take from competition, I take from jujitsu, but that's the that's the recipe for success for anything in life. From all the relationships, from anything that you do it, just keep driving, keep grinding, just keep coming. You know, 
doesn't matter how it is. And you lost it, just, you know, get a good understanding with the superior powers that made you lose, figure it out why you lost it, but just come back in the next day. That's it. Come back in the next day. Come back in the next day is the recipe for success. Right, Ray? That's it. Ray has Ray, you're I love your hair style. Okay, say <laughs> more now. At this time yeah. right now, time of the corona. I tell everybody, I have the nicest hair, you know, of all of us. Yes, you sir. know, I have the best looking hair anywhere. You know, Buyo agrees, Tom agrees, you, Buyo awesome. agree now too. You know, thank you. I appreciate that you guys agree with me on that. I agree with you. I agree with you, Ray. Good morning, guys, from Hong Kong. <laughs> oh, Kiko! Kiko! Oh, Kiko! The barrio, yeah. Kiko! 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 And Ray. DJ there with all our long hippie hairdos. <laughs> As you can see, Ray. once again, I have the best looking hair. And Ray, it does look like a mad scientist on that, that picture there. I tell you that. <laughs> big time, big time. Um, Professor, all right, guys. Listen. One, one last thing. Um, so you're, you're known for, like, of, of course, being this amazing coach for all these amazing, not only MMA people, but you also are the coach of, you know, probably I think the most accomplished like Bruno Malfacini for instance and Rodolfo Rivera uh, Vieira rather um, do you are you still coaching those guys are they elsewhere now or what's no this is what I did I got so involved with UCF eh? there was so much work to be done because the UCF doesn't stop in UCF guys the UCF is just the beginning from every university to have what we have it every university that's the goal. You know, nice. The goal is to get this as a circuit, not completely. I don't want to. I don't. I prefer not to see jujitsu as, you know, any CWA sport only. I think this is has so much more to do with the mental, and I think it can help so many people independently of your. Let me tell you this: this hezenya. You see, Shane has a hezenya. Hezenya is a word in Portuguese that means a hangout. So I was at the World Championships with Bruno. Actually, Bruno and Rodolfo were there. We're filming that. That there was a, you know, reality show that we're filming, and there was five thousand people around the bleachers there, and there was actually twenty people on a match. Right, twenty people. I think it was ten mats there. Two people competing. There was very few people on a match, and I thought, man. Every major sport is the same. You just have that very small amount of people. They're very skilled. And those guys has, you know, has to, and if we do the opposite, and if we take those guys from the bleachers and put everybody on the mats and everybody's training, because that's one thing. If you're a white belt, it doesn't matter. You're a white belt. You're the one not very skilled. If you know how to tap, and again, if you know, if you know that, the takedown is two points, and the pass the guard is three, and the mount position, and the knee on belly, and blah, blah, blah. From there on is, you know, is you would be able to train. If you'd be able to train, you'd be able to be on the mats instead of being the bleachers. So we created this Hezegna event, and we did that. We did a seminar. Everybody came in, and we we did a, a award ceremony for the guys. And, and from there, it was open mats, and people were training. And there's so much more into this, you know. When you go to jiu-jitsu, some of you guys, you probably never heard about Brazil before. Now you know where Brazil is. You don't know what acai is. You don't know. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's cultural. That's bringing in culture. And, and it's a good culture. You know, besides this, you hear Brazil about radio, about the violence of Brazilians, you know, the, the, the favelas and things like that. So... It's a good way to showcase Brazil in a in a in a in, a, in the best way that for me, but you, you know, for all of you guys there, and you guys are, you you guys are part of our heritage, though, big time, big time. You know, if you guys are training jujitsu, you're one hundred percent part of uh, of this special club. It's just starting right now. It's just going to get better and better. You know, that's what I think. Right. Well, 
Kiko. Oh, Kiko. Coño, Kiko. Guys, listen, I got to go. But listen, I just wish you all right, all the love in the world. Make sure there's one thing. Be safe. Be healthy there. And I promise you, guys, promise you, and I go see you when this craziness stops. Okay? Oh, man. God bless you guys all. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic.